Hey, Being at Work listeners, welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, Andrea Butcher. What happens when you integrate puppies, therapists, and espresso into a podcast episode? Well, you're about to find out. I love today's conversation. Now, here's the thing. I know I say that a lot because I do find value and our guests are curated and vetted. And so we find amazing, interesting people to share their stories. But here's why I love this conversation today. In this post-pandemic world in which we are living, there is a lot of buzz about meaningful work. I know I'm talking about that a lot as a coach and a facilitator. And today's guest says that meaningful work is much less about what you're doing than it is your experience in doing it. Love that reframe. Today's guest is Zach Mercurio. He's a keynote speaker and a facilitator who uses research-based, practice-proven tools to cultivate organizations that enable mattering at work. But what you really need to know about Zach is where the inspiration for this work came from. It came from an interaction with a cab driver in Washington, D.C. many years ago. You'll love this story. This episode was personally meaningful for me. Just before this conversation with Zach, as you'll hear me tell him, I had a therapy session for something that I'm struggling with in my life. And I shared that with him. And he helped me see where I matter in that situation in a way that I didn't before. So listen in as he talks about five key ingredients to mattering at work. I had so many takeaways. One is when Zach says, when people feel irreplaceable, they will act irreplaceable. Yep. Another big takeaway for me is that we can do this, help each other feel like we matter every single day. It's non-directional. You don't have to wait for someone to tell you to focus on mattering. So check it out and enjoy. Like many people, I was educated for success growing up. So if you get or achieve something that will be your signal that you've quote unquote made it. So I started to design and think about the form of my life, like what I was going to do, how I was going to do it before I actually had people that helped me to think about the function of my life, which is why I did it, what my unique strengths were. And inevitably that led to some tension because when I was in college, I had a career speaker come in and she had a really nice watch on. And she worked in advertising. And really, that's how I picked my major, based on what it would look like. And I ended up in advertising in Washington, D.C. Had all the outward indicators of success, but I was fairly miserable. And the people around me, all they talked about was what they did last weekend or what they were doing the weekend coming up. I was astonished at how many people were living for two-sevenths of their lives, the days that began with the letter S. And that is the moment that you alluded to. I was in that state of questioning and seeing people just depleted of energy where I met a cab driver who was full of energy and joyous and you could just tell. And that moment really altered what I wanted to do with my life, how I wanted to do it, and ultimately what I wanted to research and what I wanted to make better. Because I think that's an important question that nobody asked me. What do you want to make better? And that cab driver set me on the path. In what way? What did the cab driver do that so inspired you? When you're in Washington, D.C. on a weekday, you don't make small talk. That's like a social norm. And I had been in a parking lot actually pretending to be on a sales call. And a cab driver pulled up and he got out of his cab. We were just standing there watching the planes go in and out of Reagan National Airport. And he said to me, hey, how's it going? And I said, oh, man, is it the weekend yet? And it was only Tuesday at the time. And I was like appalled at myself. I had just fallen into what I was so discouraged by seeing around me. And I expected him to relate with me, to commiserate with me. And I said, hey, how how are you doing? And he just smiled so big. And he just said, oh, it's great. You can't beat this, man. I get to drive new people around every half an hour. And he started naming all these people he met that day. He got his cab and he drove away. And I was like, that's it. The most extraordinary people that I've met do ordinary things with an extraordinary perspective. When you really think about really extraordinary people and that perspective that he had and others that we've researched have tend to have a perspective where they can see 
the inevitable impact of what they're doing. And they focus on what they're getting to impact through what they're doing versus just how much they enjoy what they're doing. And by default, they end up enjoying what they're doing more and experience more meaningfulness. And that set me on a path to first in higher education, I was helping to train and develop students and do some career coaching to help students not end up like me, to help them develop the function of their lives before they start to form their lives. And then those students graduated, went into organizations, and I started being asked to go into organizations and do that work. And then I found out you could research meaningfulness. And here I am today, really helping people to re-realize their own significance wherever they are, because that sense of significance that that cab driver felt, that sense of significance that we sometimes feel of that, hey, we're worthy, we are making an impact. I believe in research is showing that is the prerequisite for everything we say we want in life and in our organizations. I think in the final analysis of human beings, feeling significant might be the crux of what it means to be human. Which is why you focus on mattering. I mean, is that your definition of mattering? Yes. Mattering is the belief that we're a significant part of the world around us. It comes from two things. It comes from feeling valued, but then knowing exactly how we add value. And mattering is a nice concept to talk about, but it's more than that. It's a basic survival instinct. When you were born as a baby, research finds you tilted your head upward and reached out to grasp for somebody so that you could procure mattering to someone enough so they would keep you alive. The only reason why anybody is listening right now to this episode is the fact that at some point in your life, you procured mattering to another human being. And that is a survival instinct and it never goes away. We search to matter before we search to eat food. And that turns into a basic need. And that as we merge into adulthood and throughout cultures, that turns into a universal longing. And it literally comes first in our lives. So it must come first in terms of how that yearning to matter is met in our organizations and work and school and life and our families. And if that instinct is not met, then the consequences can be disastrous. Yeah, that's such an interesting analogy, because in that example, unless there's someone there for the baby who's instinctively doing this to connect with, what's going to happen in that scenario? You have to help me make the connection between the analogy and the workplace, because I get that, that it is just inherent in who we are. But then in the workplace, I have responsibility to show up in a way that creates connection. I can't just expect someone to reach out and grab my hand. Can I? What do you think about that? It's just like the instinct to eat. Could you go do a good days of work without eating? Well, probably not for long. Yeah, a day, maybe. A day, maybe, two days. Sometimes when I'm fasting, I'm at my best. Yeah, sometimes. But long term, eventually, your performance will fade. The same is true with mattering in a way, just like any other instinct. For example, research finds that mattering is a key predictor of what's called social self-esteem. We actually create better relationships with others when we first believe that we matter to each other. For example, if I were to invite you to a networking event and you didn't know anybody there and I just said, here's the time and place, why don't you go and go for it. Think about your level of confidence. But if I were to say, hey, I want you to come to this networking event. I've seen many people like you who have these strengths that you have really flourish there. And oh, in a couple of days, you're going to get a call from the organizer. He has some stories to tell you about people like you who have really succeeded there and why you are really wanted there. And he's going to make a connection to you. And oh, by the way, he'll be at the door when you go in. How much confidence do you have to build relationships going into that door? A lot more comfortable in that scenario, for sure. Exactly. So when you come into the workplace, until you feel cared for, it's very difficult for a human being to care. It's almost psychologically impossible for anything to matter to a human being who doesn't first believe that they matter. So mattering is a key predictor of social self-esteem. It's a key predictor of motivation. Like you, yeah, have the responsibility to go in and do a great job and do your work and get motivated, right? When's the last time you've been motivated to do something when you didn't feel like it mattered or you mattered to who you were doing it for? It's so fundamental. And this is why it's so exciting because it's so fundamental that it's so overlooked. Yeah, it sounds like a basic need that we all have given the analogy of the baby, a basic need. Yeah. And just like all of our survival instincts, it never goes away. And unfortunately, when that instinct isn't met, we scramble around. We self-protect. 
we isolate, we try to survive ourselves. So when we feel insignificant, we act out in two ways. And this is how adults act out this instinct to matter being unmet. One, they act out in withdrawal. Quiet quitting is the inevitable withdrawal response to feeling like you don't matter to an organization. It is not a trend reclaiming your dignity, as many popular posts have pointed out or tried to spin it that way. Doing the bare minimum at anything will not lead to human flourishing. It is the inevitable withdrawal response. Isolating, withholding information, the terminal withdrawal response is what's called turnover, leaving, or people act out in desperation. Example of this is there was a psychologist who studies ostracism, and he was actually on sabbatical in Brisbane, Australia. And he came across a psychologist who had just come home from work at a prison. And she told him this story of, you wouldn't believe this. You know, we had a prisoner who was out by the fence, just sitting there. And he ran, he escaped. He escaped all the way to the fence. But guards just found him sitting there. And when the guards went and got him, they said, what are you doing? And he just said, I just wanted somebody to see me. He literally escaped, went to the prison wall just to be seen. He felt invisible, he said, in prison. No one saw him as a human being. That's the scratching, clawing, the acts of desperation. So blaming, gossip in organizations, acting difficult in organizations, protesting. These like conduct issues in schools are the inevitable response to someone who's not getting attention, seeking attention, just like your dog right now. And really, that's it. That right there. I mean, seriously, that act of desperation. That's actually perfect because those acts of desperation and many of those things we see in organizations actually stem from anti-mattering issues, not people problems. So in the work that you do, so it is about organizations creating a greater sense of mattering within their people. It's doing the things that will alleviate feelings of insignificance. Yeah. What's so powerful about the mattering concept is that it fosters resilience, well-being, motivation. It can buffer against depression, anxiety, and stress in work, but it also is almost entirely dependent on how we treat one another. My beliefs about myself, while it is entirely important to develop a positive belief about yourself, but beliefs are either upheld or disputed by their environment. So if our environment doesn't show us the evidence of our significance, it's very hard to develop the long-term belief that I am significant. It's like I've come and I went and sat in my office stay on this chair because I believe chairs are for sitting in. I didn't think, oh, is this structure for sitting in? No, I believe it's for sitting in because I've sat in it time and time again and it hasn't broken. Environment reinforces and creates beliefs. So if you want to develop self-belief, an individual self-belief is a community endeavor. And we get this wrong. We've gotten this wrong. Because we've said that individual well-being is about you pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and believing that you're enough. And that's it. But it's not ever it. No, the environment is critical in that. Okay, so I kicked off this podcast with what happens when you combine puppies, therapists, and espressos. So just prior to this podcast, I was meeting with my therapist because I am so struggling in my role as a stepmom. And what I was describing to her is that as a mom and having raised a daughter, I have a level of connection that's so different with stepkids. They have a mom, they have a dad. I don't feel like I matter. I feel useless. I don't know who to be. What do they need me for? If our environment doesn't give us evidence of our significance, there's no evidence that I'm significant in their lives. That's the core. So I'm believing that I'm not. Now, let's look at the other side of this, which is the individual side of this, which is while the evidence in our environment helps us to maintain the belief that we matter, making sure that we have the ability to see how we matter individually is also important. So for example, one of my research studies with was janitors and we embedded ourselves with a group of janitors for a year and a half, trying to understand how people in very degrading jobs, in jobs where people walk past them and don't even make eye contact, people throw trash on the floor right in front of them. How do people in these types of jobs experience meaningfulness. And one of the things that we found was that people who experience high levels of meaningfulness tend to have what I've called a so that mentality. They're able to link even like unpleasurable things with that so that. We had a janitor, we asked her, tell us about the most meaningful part of your job. And she said, it's cleaning the bathroom in a university dormitory 
after the weekends, which sounds terrible. But she said every time she goes in and cleans that bathroom, she says to herself, I'm cleaning this bathroom so that these kids don't get sick. So keeping that meaning and crafting meaning into even times where you don't feel like you're getting that feedback back is really an important foundation. That sentiment is really the crux of my earlier question about the part that the individual plays. So the environment is critical. The reason that the employee is showing up, they're so what? is also an important part of that equation. But what's interesting is I suspect in you doing this work is that people are thinking about their mattering a lot differently. Is that what you meant when you were talking earlier about helping people to re-realize their significance? Yeah, and so what's also interesting though is that janitor also had a supervisor during her first week on the job who brought her into a break room. Noticed that she was struggling and she told me during her first week on the job, she was saying to herself, I wish I could have just done something more with my life. Why am I just a janitor? Similar to feelings that you just communicated. But she had a supervisor who brought her into a break room and opened up a dictionary, had her read the definition of a custodian, which is a person responsible for a building, and everyone in it. And she said it was just a two-minute interaction where for the first time in her life, she said she felt worthy of contributing something, of responsibility. And it was just a perception shift. I mean, she just reframed the way she was thinking about her role. She reframed it, but she also had a trigger. That supervisor reminded her of her significance, noticed that she was struggling, affirmed her, showed her how she was needed for that building. And these moments are trajectory altering for people. Really, when if you're listening, just think about a person in your life, in your childhood, in your work, where a person that helped you feel like you mattered as a human being, and what did they do? And how did you feel after you left interactions with them? And what impact did that have on who you are as a person? And what we're finding in our research, interviewing people about this, is that these moments are trajectory altering or just trajectory nudging. They shift us into self-belief and self-confidence that enables us to accomplish all of the lagging indicators of motivation, performance, all of the things we say we want, which are lagging indicators. And that's why mattering is so foundational and powerful. And she doesn't even remember that supervisor's name. But it happened so quickly. It's a moment. Mattering happens in moments, not in awards banquets, like at work, not in pay. A lot of people think, hey, well, I pay people. That should show them that they matter. Paying people compensates people for their time. Policies and pay doesn't value another human being. Humans can only value other humans. Yeah. And it's something we can do all the time. What's stopping you from paying attention to everyone you interact with and pointing out the value that they're bringing, the significance that they add? Yeah, it sounds simple, but it's not common practice. Why do you think? It seems natural. It seems intuitive. Well, what's common sense is usually not common practice. When something's just so basic, for example, if mattering is as basic as eating, you know, when's the last time we like actually asked somebody what they ate last week? It's so basic that we tend to overlook it. But the last three years, something interesting has happened, the global pandemic, and a lot of people called the pandemic apocalyptic. And apocalypse, in the Greek root of apocalypse is apocalypsis, which means to reveal. And I feel like when there was an upheaval event, it revealed a lot about who we are and why we are. And it's almost impossible to ignore now. Uncaring leaders and toxic cultures are 10 times more likely to predict someone leaving than pay your benefits. Failure to recognize performance is three times more predictive of someone leaving. It wasn't the great resignation. It was a demand for dignity. People were no longer willing to give up their humanity for 25 cents on the hour anymore. But even before the pandemic, almost 65% of employees felt underappreciated. Almost 70% say they weren't recognized meaningfully once in the last 12 months. So I think what happens is that we rely on intuition to lead. Like, I'm just going to be a good person. And intuition doesn't scale. Practices and skills do. I don't think that we've cultivated as robustly the hard practices and skills of ensuring everyone around us feels valued and knows how they add value because it seems like common sense. We have processes and practices and procedures for everything else in organizations except what genuinely matters to human beings. Isn't that interesting? It's shifting. I see it shifting. You see it shifting. And I also think like people are broken I do therapy sessions in the middle of the day because I know that who I am impacts all aspects of my leadership. And so if I'm not working on myself and fixing those areas of insignificance when I feel that, that's going to show up in my leadership with my team. 
where does wholeness and employees like doing work on themselves and repairing those little T and big T trauma points in their life? And how does that connect with mattering and feeling significant? I think it's so important. And it's why I do work on helping people uncover purpose and discover their purpose and develop re- tools and resources for resilience. All of those things can be learned. But if you put a well individual in an unwell system, that individual will eventually become an unwell individual. It's the principle of toxicity. If you put any organism into a toxic environment, so no matter how healthy they, you make them, that organism will eventually become toxic and cease to be. That is why individual well-being is a community endeavor. Can you imagine how much easier it would be to work on yourself if your environment regularly gave you evidence of your significance and truly saw you and noticed you as a full human being, affirmed your unique gifts? Imagine if people regularly told you how you're needed and that was something that was just part of your everyday environment. You didn't have to question your significance. I think the amount of self-work we're asking people to do is out of proportion. I think that what happens is that we rely on people to help themselves. And that's why a lot of like well-being initiatives in organizations are really coping initiatives. You know, we're helping employees cope with the stressors and the lack of support that our system provides for them. Yeah, I mean, I think about healthcare right now, and I have lots of nursing friends and executives in healthcare, and it's like, how can we build resilience to get more out of people? And it's like, gosh, where's the environment and where's the system and process changes necessary to help people be their best? It's like, we are asking so much of people. I love that. The self-work we're asking people to do is out of proportion with the work of the around the environment shifts, structural changes. And it traces all the way back to the misuse of Maslow's hierarchy, right? So we think that there is no such thing as self-actualization. And Maslow himself said it years later. If you look at Maslow's pyramid, you have food, you have shelter, you have love, belonging, you have esteem building, and then you have like you're actualized, you can contribute. Name one of those areas up the pyramid that's not reliant entirely on other people. We rely on others to provide systems that feed us. We don't cultivate our own belonging. Our esteem, our confidence is built through the evidence of our significance in the environment. And then we contribute so that we can actualize one another. Some people in the Blackfoot Nation, indigenous group that Maslow actually took some of these ideas from, said that there is no self-actualization. There's community actualization. We're already born actualized. It takes other peoples to bring those things out. And so I think that we need a reframe from well-being is just an individual pursuit, and it's also a collective and community endeavor. And this should not be overwhelming or distressing for leaders or organizations. This should be exciting for organizations and leaders because there are behaviors we can do that are very easy to implement and it's natural. And it's natural. I think the systems we've created are unnatural, which is why toxicity and greed and all kinds of inappropriate behaviors emerge from it. It's because it doesn't feel good to anybody. It really doesn't. Exactly. And leaders themselves are in environments that show them that they don't matter until their quarterly earnings report. Leaders themselves are in environments that don't give them the evidence of their significance. They say that your worth depends on what you do or what you don't do. What's missing in the system is that how well someone does something is directly related to how much they feel like they matter while they're doing it. Yeah, it's not what you do. It's your experience in doing it. Exactly. You can't expect leaders to be morally good and in a system that incentivizes them not to be. You're like blowing my mind. I don't think it's me. I think it's just the topic, right? I get an assist from the topic. It's so fundamental that when you really think about it. Well, but the way in which you're communicating it in a way that's really helpful to me, I'll just say that. Because there's all this talk around creating work that is meaningful. I mean, you're really challenging the systems that we have put in place and you're really challenging the environment. Because I even started with like, well, the person has a responsibility and we have over-rotated. The amount of work we're asking people to do is out of proportion with the work that the environment and the system is doing. Yeah, I could throw up a graph right now. I mean, there are two unrelated data points, but I could throw up a graph that shows self-help books published in the last decade and depression and anxiety and mental health 
rates in the last decade. And you would see them going up together. No matter how many TED Talks have come out, no matter how many self-help books come out, we have increased access to mental health resources more than ever. But yet, we're still seeing widespread despair. And I really believe that one of the reasons is that we need to shift and start taking responsibility for one another's well-being. Part. Part responsibility. Part. Right? Because a leader is not responsible for everything that happens in my life. They are responsible for the effect my workplace has. And I can be a trigger and a conduit. And that's why I love the community actualization, because the leader can also model the way and be vulnerable about where he or she is growing and the struggles that he or she is having. And that helps to create that environment that's open and safe. And the byproduct is things that we are trying to pursue on their own right now, which are things like performance or engagement. It happens naturally as a result of mattering and significance. Right. There is no scenario where there is sustained human performance without sustained human well-being. None. You can try to get short-term profit spikes out of people and rely on high turnover to allow your dehumanization scheme to continue so you can keep creating these short-term spikes in profit, which is what you see a lot of big organizations doing right now. But the long-term sustained performance over time is built on long-term sustained and invested in well-being. And well-being starts with the crux, the spark of well-being is that I believe that my life is worth investing in. I believe that my life is worth the energy that I give it. And that's mattering. You wouldn't do anything today if you got up and opened your eyes and didn't believe that your life was somehow worthy of your energy today. And that's why mattering is the animating force of life and work and every action that follows. So no doubt people are listening to this and like, yes, I feel that. I get that. There's evidence of that in my life. What can I do? So both individually for a leader and for business leaders, executives. Yes. They're either saying, oh yeah, I get this, or this sounds like coddling or making sure people feel entitled. But I do want to make a distinction between that. This is not coddling. This is not not having high expectations. This is not not needing to produce results. This is actually about investing in the leading indicator of all of those things, of the results that you want. And coddling, like some people say, oh, Generation Z, they're entitled. Entitlement is an outcome. So when someone acts entitled, that is a cry for attention. For example, some people say, oh, you just want to give them trophies. You must ask yourself why they need trophies to feel significant in the first place. Why aren't they already feeling significant in their families, in their workplaces, in their schools? Why do they need an outward symbol? It's an example of acting out that you talked about earlier. Exactly. Acting out for attention. That's all entitlement is. So this is not in coddling or entitling. This is just basic. It's about as touchy-feely or coddling as feeding someone who's hungry. So now that we have that out of the way, so a few things that we can do is, and it's very simple. One is to notice people around you. And what I mean by that is that have some process to notice people. Remember people's full names. When you hear someone talk about something in their life, write it down, make a note to yourself, and then make a note to yourself to check in with those people. Ask better questions. One thing that everybody can do in the next hour after listening to this podcast is simply to ask somebody, instead of how are you, say something like, what is your attention today? What have you been thinking about? What's occupying your mind? Anything that you've been struggling with today, how can I help? These reshifts in how we engage with each other are powerful. Your FedEx driver that comes to your door, ask them what their full name is. Ask them how their day has been going, if it's a busy day. Ask them about their industry. What's it like working in delivery right now? Just do that today and your world will be opened up. I have a meeting with my marketing coordinator right after this, and I can't wait to start our meeting with, hey, Andre, what's got your attention today? Or instead of trying to be like, how are you? Try to understand what it's like to be that person. What is it like to be you, Andrea? What is it like to be you every day? You know, if you're in an airport and you see the janitor cleaning the bathroom, don't just shuffle by and nudge by the cart. Look the person in the eye and say, hey, thank you. Looks great in here. You will see someone get startled. I've done this with custodians. They're startled. Yeah, but think about that. Why are you seeing me? I'm so used to being unseen and invisible. People are startled. So notice people. You can do that today. Second is affirm people. Affirmation is not appreciation. Appreciation is showing gratitude for someone's present. Affirmation is showing people how their uniqueness makes a unique difference. 
So instead of saying thank you or good job to somebody today, describe the situation. When did it, where did it happen? Describe the behaviors they use, name their strengths, and then tell them the impact it had on you or someone else. So just reframe how you say thank you, or good job. Tell people the stories of how they impacted you. And then the third piece is show people how they're needed. The five words you can say today or as a leader that can dramatically alter your relationships with people around you on your team and inspire performance, motivation, resilience is if it wasn't for you. When people feel replaceable, don't be surprised when they act replaceable. When people feel irreplaceable, they will act irreplaceable. They will show up, they will commit. Human beings are at their best when they're needed by each other. So notice people, affirm people, show them how they're needed and find a way to get these things onto your to-do list to bridge the gap between common sense and common practice. Schedule your good intentions. Oh, I'm so glad that you're doing the work that you're doing. I'm a big yes for all of that. Those are simple things. You know, I think about in the midst of the, like my really busy day, how I'm so focused on the task at hand, the agenda, and just remembering the people in front of me. I so appreciate the trying to understand what it's like to be them. If I'm showing up with that attitude, that's naturally going to drive questions and saying things like, if it wasn't for you. And you know what? You can do this with your stepkids or your kids, because what happens is when we start truly noticing others and become entangled in their lives, we actually start to see how we matter. I'll talk about like my eight-year-old. He loves watching his tablet. Here's how I typically have dealt with that behavior. Hey, stop watching your tablet or you have 20 minutes left. I would control him and time him. And what do you think he wanted to do? He didn't want anything to do with me. But I was reading some work on noticing people and I just went up to him one day. He was watching a show and I said, hey, what are you watching? And he was sort of shocked and he was telling me about it. And I said, what do you like about it? What do you like about this show? And what do you think happened? He very slowly started shutting his tablet off and we were connecting. Gosh, it just goes back to that child, like that's yearning to matter. You got it. Yeah, my friend Leslie says, connect before you correct. And that's very consistent with that. Yeah, I love that. I've heard that before. So it's so true in the work world and in leadership. Before you work on how to get someone to perform well, make sure you help them to be well. So good. Thank you. Hopefully you feel my gratitude. I'm walking away from this, not only a better leader, but a better stepmom. How's that? And how's your espresso? We got to connect the dots here. The espresso was great. It probably got me talking way too much, but I'm sorry about that. But I will say also that it's important to understand that I teach what I need to hear the most. You know, I think it's important for listeners to hear that when you hear someone talking about mattering and meaningfulness, that I don't wake up every day and say, I matter and all the time notice other people and affirm people and show them that they're needed. But it has become the benchmark through which I determine whether the day has been a success is whether I've made sure people feel noticed, affirmed, and needed. And that's the power. And the more you talk about it, the more you're noticing it in your own life and paying attention to it. So this is not about being perfect. This is about getting started. I mean, that's why we call the show Being at Work. It's like being in the struggle, being messy, being human. We're all works in progress after all. I have pages of notes. I'm so grateful for you. Just all kinds of good takeaways here. And I appreciate the last few minutes, the practical ideas that you shared, that within the next hour, we can all help to influence the mattering of the people in our lives. And that's important. And one thing I will say is that to scale this work in an organization is to make sure that these behaviors are expected, taught, learned, and evaluated like any other behavior. And that's the gap that I see in organizations that want to do this or say things like our people are our greatest asset, but then continually struggle with engagement and turnover is that they haven't devoted the same time and energy to scaling behaviors to make sure people matter as robustly as they've scaled their operations or financial strategy. And that's what it will take. And that is why we do what we do at HRD, equipping leaders with the human skills necessary to lead their teams, to connect with their teams, to know their teams, to build that sense of mattering. I've never thought of it that way. I mean, I'm just so eager for my team to hear this. And it's very affirming, the research, the work that you're doing. I'm a big fan, Zach. I so appreciate you. I, no doubt our listeners are going to want to connect with you. What's the best way for them to do that? I've been really enjoying LinkedIn. 
I'm active on some other social media channels, but I actually enjoy LinkedIn. So connect with me there. It's me. I don't have anybody doing it for me. I write it myself. I will engage with you if you comment. I like the conversation. That's what's great about it is sometimes I write something and someone will say it so much better. And then I can say, you just said it better and try to get their voice elevated. But it just brings the awareness of caring for people, discovering purpose. And I try to bring it into common language that we talk about how to do it and common practices. And it's really fun. So I hope that you'll engage with me there. Yeah, I see your posts and they're all like mic drop moments, not to set the expectation. Uh, Not all of them, probably the ones you see that the algorithm shows you. I don't know. That has been my experience so far over the last few weeks. You're a very strong communicator. So just take that. Yeah. And I also just want to say to our listeners that you may have heard my puppy, Danny Mac, a few times. I'm not going to edit him out because he's here and he's part of the experience. And he reminds me of my significance. And he's telling us, when he needs attention. And there's my dog. Just started barking Lily. They want us. They need us. That's hysterical. Yeah, the universe is pretty cool. It is. Thank you, Zach. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast to never miss a Being at Work story. 